So I'm talking to you today about seppuku or harakiri. And these are the two terms that are used in Japan for this ritual form of suicide. And they, interestingly enough, they mean uh, really exactly the same thing. I, I studied a little bit of the entomology, right? Entomology, that's the study of words, not the study of bugs. They almost sound the same. Um, and it's very interesting. You can see the characters here for seppuku. These are Chinese characters. And you can see the, the characters for harakiri, the exact same characters, only backwards. So it means the same thing. Seppuku comes from the Chinese characters setsu and fuku, meaning belly cut. Belly cut. So, so again, this is fundamentally what this, this is about, is about cutting your own belly. And when you, when you take, pronounce these characters in, in spoken Japanese, uh, it becomes harakiri. Hara is the center part of your belly. And kiri means cut. Cut. Kiri means cut. Okay. Uh, so this is belly cutting. Now, traditionally in Japan, if you were writing something out, you were giving it somebody an order to commit seppuku, you would write out the word seppuku, and it would be pronounced seppuku. But if you're just talking to somebody, you know, just sort of in vernacular, you would use the word harakiri. Okay. So again, that's <coughs> one thing you can think of as harakiri, sort of the vulgar way of, the commoner way of, of talking about this. And seppuku is the formalized way that you would write down an official, something official. Right, official death report. He died by seppuku. Right, you would not say died by harakiri. That'd be very incredibly vulgar. Um, and again, this is actually a little manual, Japanese manual about committing seppuku and talking about the different types of belly cuts. And for the most part, um, what you see is this type of belly cut here, uh, going uh, vertically across. And then uh, sometimes, up, sometimes up the middle, that's very tough. Sometimes over here, up a little bit. Um, <coughs> and, and these are the variations. Sometimes you go up and down. If somebody's really hardcore, they can really go up and down. But this is very hard to do. Okay? And I'll talk to you a little bit about the um, implements for doing this. This cut is not a super deep cut. Okay, it's not a super deep cut. It's not like you're taking that thing and just thrusting it all the way inside. Sometimes in the movies you'll see that. It's actually, you're actually probably going in about yay amount. And then you're going across, you know, and you're, you know, the idea is not that you're going to be cutting into your intestines, but you would be cutting through the skin and the muscle. The intestines could fall out. And then you're getting over here, you're going to go up, you're going to cut maybe into the liver. And that's probably what's going to kill you quickly. Right? And then if you do work back here and you go straight up, then you're cutting into blood vessels and things like that. Um, so this is the basic thing. And you can see this is a little bit, this, is, this diagram here is the sort of typical up over here and then up a little bit. Right? It's sort of typical kind of cut here. Now, seppuku harakiri probably began as a way for samurai warriors to avoid being captured and or tortured after losing a battle. And, um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about Japanese torture techniques, but if you read some of the um, accounts of the Christians who were uh, tortured after uh, you know, Christianity was outlawed in Japan, you can, there's lots of accounts of these. You can get a sense that some of these tortures were really quite brutal and quite creative at the same time. You know, throwing people in pits of snakes and you know, dangling them upside down, all sorts of things. And so this, some of these things would have happened to samurai um, after, after a battle, especially in the old days, right? But later on, what happens is that, you know, probably the torture is going to be applied to regular common people, and probably you wouldn't, you know, torture a samurai in the same way that you would torture a commoner. Um, but they would still, you know, torture was still around, it was still used. Uh, there were lots of judicial tortures, you know, you get confessions out of people in ancient Japan. They had all sorts of interesting ways of, uh, of getting people to confess things. Um, so, battle's over, it looks like you've lost, you know, so, you know, rather than deal with these guys torturing you or gloating over you or capturing you and ransoming you, that kind of thing, you would, you would commit seppuku on the battlefield, okay? And you would use, either, you might use your full sword, because you're not carrying around, you know, or you might use a wakazashi, which is the short sword, or you might use a tanto, which is the blade, the small blade. Okay. But battlefield seppuku could just take your big sword and just you know put it up against your heart and just fall into it, right? So it was much less formalized. It was uh, more expedient. You didn't have a lot of time, 
And I will say, after the battle, also you'll find uh, female samurai, uh, the wives of the warriors, uh, samurai warriors, also uh, very typically would commit um, seppuku, and not only to avoid uh, all these things, but also to avoid rape. Okay, so you know your castle has fallen, the invading uh, army is coming in, and um, as a female, you know that if you're just there. Uh, the likelihood of you being raped is very high, and of course this is true throughout uh, uh, um, uh, hu human battles, throughout the, the history of warfare that women get raped. Very common. I talk about that in the Nazi Germany class when I talk about genocide. I'll talk a little bit about that, and uh, Reiner will talk to you about um, you know, the invasion of Germany uh, by the Russians at the end of the war, and um, the high incidence of rape. So this is something that's very common in war, and the ancient Japanese were no different. And so women, to avoid being raped, would commit seppuku. Women did not commit seppuku in the same way as men. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And you'll see woodcuts. Here's a guy here. He's using his full sword, and he's doing the, doing the seppuku here as the invading army is coming over. Question. Yeah. What's a tanto? A tanto is a small blade. Knife. Knife. There's a knife, there's the wakazashi, which is a little bit bigger, and there is the katana, which is, you know, yay big. And so again, sometimes the difference between the tanto and the wakazashi gets a little blurry, because you can have short wakazashis or long tantos, and they are made in the exact same way as the samurai sword. Remember I talked to you about the samurai swords and how they fold the, steel over, the hard steel over the soft steel? The tanto and the wakazashi are made exactly the same way, they're just shorter. Okay, so these are very sharp, okay, like razor blades. Okay. Now, uh, the practice of seppuku harakiri became formalized in the 17th century, and this included the addition of a guy called the kaishaku, uh, kaishakuin. Okay, and the shaikaku, kaishakuin was the second. This is the second. Okay? This is the person who basically delivers the coup de grace after you've done the act, the thing that's going to kill you, and you're in, which is extremely painful, by the way, if you can imagine, sticking a knife in your belly and pulling it across, going up, extremely painful. And so again, you know, the idea here is that committing seppuku here really shows your warrior spirit, your warrior resolve, and it's really painful. And you have your a second there who, when you are done with this, you know, will basically chop your head off and, and finish you off, right, in a way that's supposedly pretty quick and, I don't know, painless, but pretty quick. Okay. Um, the kaishakuin is not always used, okay? So if you're really hardcore, and especially if you're doing a seppuku on your own somewhere, meaning harakari on your own, you would just go ahead and finish yourself off, and you might do all this belly cutting stuff and, you know, really hack at it, and then you're done, you might take the knife and then, and then, and then cut your throat, slit your throat, or drive the knife into your throat, and then cut a main artery here, uh, main vessel, and then bleed out and die that way. Rare was the case where the guy would just cut his belly and then just fall over and keel out and die slowly, but that did happen sometimes. Sometimes people do it on their own. But the second uh, was especially useful um, in a formalized setting, a planned harakiri. You were planning on doing it and, and um, you, know, you, you did it as a public uh, uh, spectacle. You know, rather than just you know, sitting there bleeding out and taking an hour to die, you'd have this guy sort of finish the job off. Now there's a few variations of seppuku harakiri, so a few different kind of motivations. First, I mentioned avoid the capture or torture on the battlefield. Um, and then to rectify a situation where the samurai has lost their honor for some reason. And this can be a number of reasons. You know, again, it could be losing a battlefield, it could be um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you've done something, you made a mistake. You know, you, you, you told your, your, your daimyo, your lord, you said, look, you know, don't worry about things, you know. Everything's going to be great. We've done all the polling. Hillary Clinton is going to win the election. There's no, nothing to worry about. And then the election comes, and lo and behold, the polls were all wrong. You were wrong. You told your lord and master that, you know, something completely erroneous, and now you've lost face, you've lost honor, and the only thing for you to do to regain that honor and to regain the honor of your family and your family line is to commit harakiri, right? And so you'd go, and you would apologize, and you would commit harakiri. Okay. Um, and you, I'm, I'm obviously making up, you know, a fanciful thing, but you can imagine something like that. 
you, know, you gave your, your, your lord wrong advice, you know, you were in charge of a shipment of gold going from one place to the other place and it got stolen, anything where you would lose honor, you would lose face, um, could be a reason why you might commit harakiri. Another reason later on what comes about is harakiri becomes a kind of a judicial sentence. In other words, you have screwed up somehow, but you might have screwed up in a way that's somewhat criminal. You, you went against a rule, you went against the law, and your lord, uh, the daimyo, or other superior, would order you to commit harakiri. Like the 47 ronin? Like the 47 ronin. The big, big example, the 47 ronin. This guy's sort of just protesting against what's going on, and they, you know, they commit a, what could be seen as an act of treason, and then they are, they are sentenced to um, commit harakiri. I was going to show you a clip of the recent movie, The 47 Ronin, where there's a great clip of all of them sort of in mass committing harakiri, but we already showed you one, one white guy saving Japan in the form of, uh, uh, what's his name? Tom Cruise. Tom, Tom Cruise. And I did not want to show you Keanu Reeves doing the same thing. So I spared you that because he's, he's in the seppuku scene and he's, you know, he's going to do this. You know, uh, you know, okay, no, I couldn't do it. So I couldn't bring myself to do it. But yes, 47 Ronin, a very good story. If we had time, and we, we had time, we could watch the film. There, there's a good film, earlier, older film, which is really quite good, um, but we won't see that. So again, judicial order. Okay, you did something wrong, you know, you screwed up. And you know, hey, you know, or you did something that brought dishonor upon not necessarily yourself, but the clan. And that's, you know, equivalent to sort of a crime. Your lord will say, you, you know, go commit harakiri, you know, and you would be required to go off and do it, or they would have a big ceremony and you would do it. Okay. Somebody's going to take the blame. Somebody's going to take the fall, right? So the Lord doesn't look bad. Oh, you take the blame. You're going to get hard to carry. Okay, that would happen. And then the last one is very interesting. Sometimes hard to carry is performed as a protest against the policy of a superior or to stress a really strong opinion about something. This was called kanchi, which is re re remonstration death. Right. So in this case, sometimes the harakiri was like you see here, that you commit harakiri, you would go to your boss, and your boss would say, I'm going to do this. And you say, really, I don't think that's a good idea. That's going to like, you know, you, I'm going to go out and wage war against this other clan. You would go to your boss, that's not a good idea. They're stronger than us, we're going to lose, and it's going to be bad for all of us. And your boss is like, ah, oh, you're full of crap. I'm going to do it anyway, right? And then you would go back and you would write a note saying, I think this is wrong, commit seppuku, and then that would convey to your superior your strong opinion about something. Another way that this was done. Yes. Well, wouldn't the opposite be correct though as well? If if the Lord wants to go to war and then his, his second command tells him this is a bad idea, but the Lord does it anyway. The Lord loses. He'll blame the second command and commit all four. That could happen too. Yes. Not being in charge is tough. <laughs> Politics is tough, right? But this is what they would do. Another way this would be done would be that the guy would go and he would he would make his protest by committing seppuku where he would do the belly cut. And then what he, you know, so he's going to die now because this is not modern times where we have surgery and ways to save people. He's bleeding out. And what he would do is then wrap a very tight bandage around his belly, around the hara here, wrap himself up. And then he would get himself over in front of the Lord and he would say, boss, I really, in the most strongest terms possible, want to protest your decision to do whatever. And he would unwrap the thing, show the, the belly cut that he was dying, and then keel over right then and there. That was the other way this was done. Okay. Demonstration, yeah. Were there any times where they refused when they were like sentenced to this? Did they run away? Or? Well, Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit more about the judicial hierarchy. here. So yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do this, you know. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm your daimyo. I've sent you to Harakiri, and I think you're going to run away. So we'll keep him in the jail, tied up. And then we're going to come, and when we do the Harakiri, rather than putting the knife in front of you, because I don't know, you're pissed off at me. You're going to take that knife. You may take a couple guys out with you, right? So what we're going to do, instead of a knife putting in front of you, we're going to put a nice fan. And as soon as you reach for the fan, that's when the Kai Shakun cuts your head off. And, 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 and then later on what happened is in Harakiri that things became decadent 
And you know, you, you find is that it, it became the ritual became somewhat formalized. So even people who were voluntarily committing harakiri would just have the fan and just reach for the fan, and the guy would cut their head off. Right. So if you want to think of this as sort of a judicial form of execution later on, yes. If you want to think of it as the hardcore ritual, really proving your manliness by, you know, slicing your belly, kind of gets diluted over the while to the point it just becomes a very kind of a formalized ritual where you're just reaching out and you know, your head's cut off, you know. Both of those things happen. Now it becomes the, the ritual becomes more or less standardized uh, starting in the 1600s up until 1867. You know, and actually, once you have the Meiji Restoration, this becomes banned. Um, but of course, uh, uh, harakiri continues on even to modern day. And you know, the last famous case of a guy committing harakiri that I knew about was the writer Mishima who was a right-wing nationalist Japanese writer who was, um, uh, you know, would write all this stuff and was real pro-Japan becoming this nationalistic power. And when the government didn't seem to be going that way, he uh, took over an office, uh, which was an office of a general in the Japanese Defense Forces, and with one of his, uh, his disciples uh, committed harakiri right there. And Mishima was able to commit harakiri. His second did not do such a great job. I think it took him maybe two slices to get through. Uh, the, the disciple really botched it up and had to be dispatched. Um, or maybe the disciple lived. I can't remember. Uh, but they, well, that was the last one. That was 70, 71 that happened. Yes? That was the guy who, who appealed to the press and said, won't you stand up and join me? And yes. And the, yes, he appealed to the press. He was out in the balcony. Everybody was there. I'm going to go do it right now. And everybody was there around him. And they were holding the office building sort of hostage. And um, yeah. And there's, there's some very good, uh, there's, there, there's a movie made about Mishima, and you can watch this in the movie. You can see the scene where he commits Harakiri. Uh, but he was one of the later ones. So it's, it's still what happened. Um, again, more or less along this formula. Um, so the first thing is uh, there were witnesses, especially if this was a ritual that was planned in advance, you knew that it was happening. And by the way, this is a picture of a scene from the movie Harakiri, where this guy shows up. A uh, ronin samurai shows up and says, you know, I'm a ronin samurai, I can't get a job, and so I'm, I'm ready to end it all, so would you do me the favor as fellow samurai of, you know, hosting my seppuku, right? And that's how the movie goes. And here we go, it's got all, the, it's got all the, the rituals. A lot of these key elements, by the way, include things that are inspired by Zen Buddhism and by Shintoism, okay? Such as the, the ritual bathing in the beginning. So there's witnesses, especially if this was planned in advance, there's a ritual bath beforehand showing uh, cleanliness and purity. Notice this bucket over here with water. This is a Shinto thing. You see this at temples where you go and you drink a little of the special water. Uh, again, this is a purity thing. Uh, there'd be a last meal. Okay. There would be then the wearing of a Shinai sho, uh, uh, Shozuk, uh, sho, Shokyu, Shozoku. I don't think you pronounce the middle thing there. Uh, but this is the white death kimono. Death is the color of white. Again, this is also kind of a Shinto thing. Okay. Um, then there would be a small table in front, this little table with a tanto. This is a tanto here, a blade. And there'd be like some rice paper there. And what you would do is wrap the rice paper around the blade. The reason for this is to get a, you want to have a two-handed grip because this helps you resolve. You've got to wrap the rice paper. And you can wrap the rice paper around and you can exert pressure this way without really cutting yourself. Remember, it's the forward and back of the knife that's going to do the cutting. So if you're just pressing down on it, you can wrap the paper around and hold that, and that will help you put it in. Usually you're doing this as a two-handed technique, you know, going over. So, so the paper allows you to have a, a, a both hands on it. The other reason the paper, I think, is useful is you'll notice the paper will tell you how far you're going to put the knife in. Maybe you're not plunging the whole thing in. You're just putting this much in. Okay? So the paper, where the paper ends, that's how far it's going to go in. Right? So you're not putting the whole thing in and trying to go all the way through, because that would be almost impossible. And be on this table, and what you would do is you would pick the, you'd be kneeling, you'd pick the knife up, you would sit in the seiza position, you'd be pick the knife up, pick the knife up, and you take the table and you whip it around behind you, and then prop yourself up on the table so that when, you, when you're finished, you actually would fall over this way, you wouldn't fall over backwards. So the table had the purpose also of propping the guy up uh, at the end. Okay. Then you would write a death poem, and these death poems would be very, uh, you know, very much inspired by Zen. Here's one from Shiaku Nudo, uh, who died in 1333, 
And it goes like this. Holding forth the sword, I cut emptiness in half. In the midst of the great fire, a stream of refreshing breeze. That was his death poem. He wrote that right before he committed uh, sepulchral feet. Death poems also are people who are just dying would write death poems. This is the kind of thing you would write. And then you'd have a little ritual cup of sake. And then you would proceed with the act. Now, as a treat for you all, when I do the sword demonstration, I am going to show you, uh, I'm going to, we're going to demonstrate, um, obviously simulate, demonstrate uh, this ritual. Okay? And to do that, just for you guys, I have learned the uh, um, kaishaku kata. The second kata. There's a specific kata that is used for uh, the sword technique for doing this. And there's a lot of very interesting things about the sword technique. I'm going to show you about that. So I'm going to show you guys this. I'm going to demonstrate this. Um, and I'm hoping to get my friend, uh, my colleague uh, Dave, uh, uh, to, uh, to be the uh, guy committing seppuku. I, he just, it's not, he's not really too strongly thrilled about doing this. Uh, but we'll figure something out. And I will show you actually how the second uses the sword, what he does, um, all that kind of stuff, which is really quite interesting. And then we'll go through the... Um, to some degree, show you the ritual here. Without doing it, we're not really going to do it. The kaikushin is at the ready. The samurai would open the robe. They would feel for a spot at the lower belly, right? So, you know, we're talking about right above. Again, it's where that dough cut is going to be, right above the hip bone, but below the abdomen. So, you know, right here, about maybe an inch below your belly button. You'd feel for this spot here. You pull up the robe here. You know, you get it right here. You'd feel for that spot. You put the knife blade at the edge of it. Grab it, in, over, and then maybe up a little bit. And then, you know, this is incredibly painful. You know, if you're really doing it correctly, you do this without uttering a sound. You're totally stoic about it. And then when you've had enough and the pain's too much, you would lean forward slightly, extend your neck out. That's the signal to the second, the kaikushin, to give the coup de grace. Okay. Oh, actually, what you also would do is you really were doing it correctly. You go over here, the knife would go in. You would actually remove the knife, put it out there, take the knife out, and then go over, and then they would do it. So you actually, but you don't see that often in the films. In the films, often the guys don't, you know, film versions, of this, they often don't remove the knife at the end. In fact, it's interesting because I looked around for, to find um, uh, film versions, movie versions of, you know, Harakiri, where it was done, you know, really correctly. And I was very hard to find any. You know, there's always, I look and think, no, that's a little bit of a mistake there. And the, kai, the, the Kaishakuin, almost no, none of them in the movies are doing the correct kata. You know, some guys are just standing there like, oh, yeah, you know. No, there's a ritual kata to doing this. I don't see much of it in the movie. Now, what you would do is the, the, the kai, uh, Kaishakuin would cut but he would cut not all the way through. Because if you just cut the head off, it's gonna go rolling like a you know, bowling ball down the thing in front of the lords and the, and the, and the, and the royalty you know, and the higher ups, and that, that's just really bad for him. And then as the Kaishaku, and you might live, you know, your family might be in disgrace because of that. You might be the next one committing Harakiri because you've lost <coughs> honor doing this. Right, did it right. So you have to be, you have to make the sword cut. So there's a little bit of tissue, skin or throat tissue here left. So the head just sort of flops down and either falls into the lap or is just hanging down. And that's the correct way. And you can imagine what happens when you do this. You know, the blood's coming out and everything. There's a correct way to do it. And so you had to be a very good swordsman to do this. If you were just sort of a hack swordsman, you're not going to be a good second. The second had to have some skill. Right? Very easy to screw this up. You had to make a very precise cut. Right. Um, usually it was a friend or somebody who was well respected. In a judicial seppuku sometimes it's performed by someone assigned to the duty, almost like an official executioner kind of guy. Um, but you did not want to be a, a, a kaishaku. Not a fun job to have. Nobody looked forward to this job. Because first of all, if you did it right, you got nothing, nothing good came out of it, right? If you did it wrong, you know, there, were, there was potential really bad consequences. So it was not a position that was sought out by people. Okay. 
You really want to, okay, go, I'm going to commit seppuku and like, you know, you're going to be my second. Hey, look, can I talk you out of that? You know, that's really not a good, you know, you really got a lot to live for. You know, there's really good things going on here. You really don't need to do that. You know, I really don't want to be the second. And it sucks. Okay. And this is, by the way, the second from the film Harakiri. And this guy's the sword master. He does not, uh, and again, this proves the point. He does not uh, fare well in the film. Um, now, I talked I talk about women. Women didn't do seppuku in the same way as men. Instead of a belly cut, samurai women would tie their legs together and they would cut their neck. They would cut the, uh, you know, big artery here of the neck. Much simpler, much less pain, uh, pain involved. Um, and women weren't seen as necessary of having to suffer through all the pain of the belly cutting. And again, if you go online and you look up uh, women and harakiri, you'll find women doing the belly stuff which may have happened, I don't know, but that wasn't the typical uh, way. Usually when we use a tonto, they cut their neck and they tie their legs together so they would be upright and dignified, not falling over, sprawling around. Um, here. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, samurai women, you know, I haven't spoken a lot about women in, in, in ancient Japan, samurai women, but samurai women actually had their own sort of expertise in, you know, as warriors. They were also seen as warriors. Okay. And they actually would fight with this weapon here, which is a long stick with a blade on the end called the naginata. This was the, this was the, the, the women's weapon. And people still practice naginata. You can find people still practicing with it. So if you're a woman and you want to learn a traditional Japanese weapon that was wielded by women, you would go and you would study uh, the naginata. See, and this is a very, very effective, very, very good weapon. All right. So I think that's all I have to say about Harakiri. Any questions on this stuff? And I will show you more. We'll do the demo. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a real view of this stuff um, up close with swords uh, in a couple weeks. Okay.